One of my favorite songs is a song called New York Minute. It's by Don Henley. Some of you guys know that song. Some of you guys are classic rock fans. For those of you who don't, it's a great song. Go look it up. Some of you even now have the, uh, as soon as I said that, you got the chorus in your head, right? In a New York Minute, everything can change. In a New York Minute, things can get really strange. Ooh. Anyway, so there's like a whole kind of thing there. I love that song for a couple of reasons. First, it's introspective. It's, a, it's got some really great introspective lines. The second reason I love it is for a phrase in the song that I think is true. It's very, very true. Certainly, it's, it's so true. I use it in every premarital counseling class uh, that I give. It's something that the more that I've grown in my own spiritual walk with God, the truer that I've found that it is. And here's the line. It says, the wolf is always at the door. The wolf is always at the door. Some of you know what I'm talking about. If you're uh, married, you know that the wolf, the temptation is always there. There's always a chance to torpedo your marriage. And so there's lots of temptations that come in. If you're single, there's always a temptation to be less than you are, to appeal or to pursue a lesser voice in your life. If you're a follower of Christ, the wolf is always at the door, it seems, to derail your attempt to follow Christ to tell you that you're too tired to wake up this morning and follow him, that things are too hard to get up and follow him, that, you know, life will march on even if you're not with it, right, instead of following him. And so there's all these kind of temptations and lies that the wolf brings to your door. And listen, the wolf is always at the door. The truth is the wolf has always been at the door for millennia, and that is also the case with Jesus. And so we've been in this series called Follow in the Gospel of Luke, and we come to the temptation of Christ in Luke chapter 4. Won't you turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 4 as we look at the temptation of Jesus Christ, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 15. How did Jesus handle the wolf? when he was literally at the door. How does that work? So uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, some of you are trying to find it. We believe here that the word is the filter. And some of you are very familiar with that filter. Some of you, you're just now figuring it out, right? Like, Derek, I bought my first Bible. Um, I was speaking with someone a couple of weeks ago, and they're like, this is the, I got, you know, I got a Bible. And I was like, oh, that's great, you know? Then I looked at it, and it was, King, you know, King James. And... Uh, <laughs> And I said, do you understand anything you're reading? And they said, yeah, like a third. So I said, let me help you with it. So anyway, whatever version you have, whatever resonates with you in whatever language, they're all beautiful uh, translations. Uh, we use the ESV around here, uh, but I want to encourage you to get your Bible out. Let's use that as uh, the word of God. Won't you stand with me in honor of God's word? Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4 of the book of Luke. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Understatement of the year. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, well, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and probably overlooking the Kidron Valley and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Isn't that just how he works too? Waiting for the next opportune time. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Let's pray. We come to you, Father, just as we are Looking at this text, recognizing that Jesus in this moment was really just as he was designated to be. And Father God, we ask that you would teach us through it so that we can be more like your son. 
Uh, help a, a travesty not to occur this morning, Father, where we come, we listen, and it goes in one ear and out the other, and it never implants its way into our hearts. Instead, Father, I pray that that seed would take root in good soil and produce a lot of fruit in my life as well as the lives of others. In your son's name, amen. You may be seated. On, uh, on July the 4th, yes, this last July the 4th, I was out running. Well, if you're a runner, I was probably jogging, okay? I wasn't running that fast. But I was out running, and I came around a corner, and I saw this young couple uh, holding hands, just kind of talking, enjoying each other's company. And I was really kind of moved and touched by this. And so I went out and I took a picture as I was running. <laughs> I kept running. I didn't post it or anything. But I just, I was like, wow, that is like so great. You know, usually when, uh, like I married up, okay? Like I married amazingly well. And I love hanging with Melissa. And I think she likes hanging out with me. And um, usually when you go out, right, you go out with a reason. There's a reason that you're going to go. So we have a Weimaran or a dog, Bibi, who thinks she's a person. And we uh, love to take her out for walks. And so we will go to walk the dog, right? The, the dog is the excuse, and that's why you go walking. Um, sometimes we like to exercise. And so we'll go for, we have a four-mile walk that we'll do around our neighborhood. And so you'll put on the athletic gear. You've seen couples around your neighborhoods, right? They're wearing spandex they shouldn't wear. And then they kind of go around the neighborhood. And, you know, and like, this is my big, and so everybody's kind of sweating. And so you go for that reason. But, but the, the best moments of all are really when you're just hanging out with someone because you just love being intimate with them. You know, and I was reminded of that. I was, had done a little bit of fasting that week. And so I was kind of in a conversation with God. And, and as I was coming around that corner, it was like, God said, look, just take a moment just to be with me just to hold hands. I mean, right, this is why teenagers hang out at malls and young couples hang out at malls in every mall in America, right? It's like we really held hands and, you know, we're walking along and we're talking and it's just nice to be together. Oh, sail at J. Crew, right? And then you kind of come back and there's that kind of, it's just enjoying the company of the other person. Why fast? Like, who cares if you skip a meal, Right? Isn't that called like the most extreme diet ever? Like, so what, Jesus went on a diet and found himself wandering in the desert? Like, is that what's happening here? And yet, we find that Jesus prayed and fasted a lot. And the early church, they prayed and fasted. In the Old Testament, they prayed and fasted. And so it has to be more than just skip a meal for the sake of having smaller calories, all right, there's got to be something that's going on here. And biblically, the reason to fast is to draw close in your intimacy with God. It's not to put another thing on your to-do list. It's to take something off so that you can solidify your commitment to him, so that you can draw in close to him, so that you can be with him at a great and intimate moment, so that even as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you even more than the meal that is calling my name. So Jesus goes to pray and fast. He does it for 40 days. Now, I've had friends who have fasted for 40 days, just water for 40 days. The longest I've ever gone is seven. The first time I ever fasted, it was a three-day fast. It was in Colorado Springs. I only did water, and I, it was hard. By the third day, like, I could smell the hamburger cooking at a Red Robin, like, five miles away. So... Luke takes Jesus and he puts him in a wilderness and he says, okay, Jesus is going to be tempted. But in the context of this temptation, Luke points out that Jesus was hungry. I love that little statement. A, because it's so understated. Like after 40 days, I'd be a little hungry too. No, no, you wouldn't be hungry. Your stomach would shrink and he was right. No, no, trust me. He was hungry. Why does Luke point this out? Like, what is the reason for that? So you have your sermon notes. There's places in there you can fill this out. But we, we begin to get intimate with Christ. And Jesus is going into the wilderness. He's fasting. He's praying to be intimate with God. But as he's doing that, he's doing that for a reason. As he's closing in with God, as he's drawing into God, right? The Bible states that he was hungry. And Luke is doing this for the reason that he wants us to note that Jesus was 100% man. 
Now, if you have ever been raised in church or you've been around church long enough, you know that there is one answer to any question in Sunday school or in your adult Bible study or in a message like this where anybody's asking feedback that trumps every other answer you could possibly give. When you give this answer, you just automatically appear more spiritual. And so everybody gives the same answer to just about any question that gets asked. You know what that answer is? You do. Jesus, right? How was Jesus able to, you know, you know, well, he was God's son. It's just Jesus is God's son. It's the trump card of everything, right? Like, how did Jesus do that? Well, it's because he's Jesus. He's Jesus. And every time you give an answer, yeah, oh, that's really deep, man. Because how do you argue with Jesus? You can't argue with Jesus. Someone throws out Jesus, that's all you got. You're left kind of going, well, okay, you're, yeah, you're right. What well, color's the sky? I want to say blue, but I'm going to go with Jesus today. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, that's deep. Yeah, Jesus is above the sky. I get where you're going with that, right? Luke's going out of his way to say, look, Jesus is 100% man. In other words, he got hungry. The urgency of him wanting food is as tempting as whatever is pulling you in your life. Now, Jesus didn't go through every single temptation that you and I have gone through. It's, it's not that, well, you know, yeah, gee, Jesus has been through the temptation of, you know, affairs and all the rest of it, and then he's got this going on and that going on. You know, should he be, you know, gene tested or what? No, it, that's not the point. The point is that the urgency that you feel for your pornography temptation, for your temptation to overeat, for your temptation to go do things that help you and satiate your urges, right? Those kinds of things. He felt those urges as urgently, if not more than you would. And by the way, he had twice the capacity that you do to fulfill all of those urges. Right? Why? Because he's Jesus. So Satan starts this first temptation with a really small thing. Well, you're hungry. Turn the stone into bread right? You can eat. It's a small temptation. It's not a big temptation. But it's a temptation that says, look, I want you to focus on this object as being the thing that can satiate your urge, satiate your desire. Like, let's leave God the Father out of this. Let's leave, like, communion out of this. Like, honestly, you're hungry. Let's satiate that thing. Let's take care of that itch that has to be scratched. They go, no big deal, right? A bigger deal would have been, like, you know, a put together a nine-course feast. And Jesus would be like, oh, cool, I can do that. You know, I'll get on Chef's Table on Netflix. They'll write a documentary about all that stuff. But it's just a small thing. Just take this little stone and turn it to bread. And I think one of the very first things that we're learning here is that we have to follow God to reliance. That we follow him to the sense of saying, no, my hope is not in satiating the urge. My hope is in being connected with you. So does my craving for you trump my craving for the, the food, for the object, for whatever it is in your life that you think is going to fix everything else? This last Thursday, I was in conversation with someone whom I know and love, and uh, they go grocery shopping to Mariano's every Thursday. And every time they go, they get the exact same thing. They go in, they get a Raisin Bran muffin, and they get a cup of coffee. And it's their favorite thing. By the way, if you haven't been to Mariano's, here's a plug. Go to Mariano's. It's a great place. You'll hang out. And so this person goes in every week. And that's, what they, that's their routine. And this last Thursday, they went in. And they went to get a Raisin Bran muffin. And guess what? No Raisin Bran muffin. And like that's, like, that's their whole morning. Right? So this person was like, you know, yeah, I went in there. No Raisin Bran muffin. Like, my day is getting off on the wrong foot. You can't do that. So ask behind the counter, well, do you have any back there? Like, are there any Raisin Bran muffins anywhere in the store? Because if you have one way in the back, now is the time to bring it out. I got to kick this morning off right. And they were like, oh, I'm so sorry. We don't have anything right now. Wow. Man, my whole day is ruined because I don't have this Raisin Bran muffin. Goes back, does the other thing that they know to do, which is to get a cup of coffee. Person... They put the rewards number in. The person says, hey, by the way, you have enough points. You can get a free cup of coffee. And this person said, can, any size? And they're like, yeah, any size you want. Totally for free. Fine, I'll have a large cup of coffee. Great. Takes the large cup of coffee, starts wandering the aisles, doing their grocery shopping. Guess the whole time what they're thinking about? 
raisin bran muffin. Free cup of coffee, raisin bran muffin. All right. Goes to the checkout line, gets to the checkout. They're winging everything through and they say, oh, by the way, we have this new rewards program. New rewards program? I've been coming here for a while. I don't know about this. Absolutely. Turns out you've got 36 extra dollars we can apply towards your grocery bill. Are you for real? 36 extra? Absolutely. We're going to reduce it. Do you want that to be applied today? Yes. Yesterday, if possible. Like, apply it now. Grocery bill reduced by $36. A large free cup of coffee walks out of Mariano's. Guess what they're thinking about? My day is ruined. Where's my Raisin Bran muffin? That's how temptation starts. It gets you so fixated on the object, the thing. If I can just do this, if this will get fixed, then everything else will be okay. Well, guess what? That thing, after it gets fixed, there'll always be something else. He fixates you on the object as being the thing that will satiate your desire. And in the meantime, all of the blessings get lost. All of the capacity for wholeness gets thrown out the window. Well, there's a couple of other ways I think we can follow him. And to lead us through those, I'm going to ask Doug Bush, who's one of our teachers here at Grace Point. He helps to teach in family, family builders class to come and lead us through those two points. Doug, why don't you come on up? Let's give Doug a round of applause as he comes up this morning. Thanks. Thank you. So you're reflecting on all those ways that you are not relying. So we're not here to give you a guilt trip, but unpack these uh, truths and these, these temptations. So I'm here to make some observations, and Derek's giving me the opportunity to make some observations about the next two temptations that Jesus faces in this passage. The two temptations I'm going to talk about, one of them is admiration. The other is validation. So admiration and validation. Now I see a couple of you who want to be done and or maybe you're the best students in the class. You've already written the next two blanks. Those were the wrong things to write in the blanks. So uh, maybe you need a new bulletin. Maybe you need a new set of notes. Those are not the answers. And perhaps that's a good example of why we're even going through this teaching section is the temptations are never the answers. The temptations are simply there to point us to the answer, which is, how does Jesus respond to these situations? How can we emulate that? How can we follow him? And what does he model for us in each of these temptations? So let's dive in and unpack the first one. The first one I said was admiration. We have a hyper focus in the society on admiration. What does admire even mean? It means to hold something on a pedestal, to put it there, to have, it, have a claim and praise, applaud, to rank it highly, to hold it in high esteem. I mean, we, we just know how to admire things. We admire someone's courage and we admire someone's landscaping. We just know how to admire. Our whole society is built around it. You see in the magazines, all the lists, the top 100 most admired companies, most admired people, most admired couples, most admired Hollywood celebrities, most uh, uh, admired sports franchises. It's everywhere uh, in the culture. My father-in-law is a Marine, uh, so um, I married up, but he's thinking that his daughter married down probably a little bit. Um, and I greatly admire my father-in-law. And he's well-versed in military rank. And so he would remind me that the, the highest rank in the Navy is the title admiral. So even the level and the title of the highest ranking military officer uh, reflects on that word admire. You meet somebody for the first time, and what, is the, what does the conversation inevitably go to? Well, uh, hi, how are you? Um, so what do you do? And uh, well, here's what I do. And uh, where did you go to school? And uh, where do your kids go to school? And uh, any memberships, uh, any committees that you chair, anything that should distinguish you? Why don't you see what happens? We start to just unpack our trophy case of life. And they start unpacking theirs and we get it all out on the table so that we're both kind of sizing each other up, making sure we understand what is gonna be the glory or admiration pecking order 
Because that's what we do. That's how we measure. That's how the world measures. That's how the prince of this world measures. And so this particular temptation is right in Satan's kind of calculus, isn't it? And so he, based on what Derek said, Jesus is 100% man, so he draws on that desire to be admired for this temptation. And so he takes Jesus to a high point, and he says, in an instant, I'm gonna show you all of the kingdoms of the world. And this could all be yours. It's been given to me. I can give it to whomever I choose. I'll give you all those. The kingdoms aren't actually the biggest deal. The kingdoms then lead to, I'll give you what? All the authority, all of the splendor, some translations say all of the glory associated with those. Just one small thing. You just have to bow and worship me. Well, here's the truth. Jesus knows that this version of admiration is an imitation brand. It's fool's gold. It cannot be given something that can ultimately fulfill from someone who is already doomed, who never had it to begin with, and who's already, uh, in the end, can't deliver because of their limitations. So that position you're looking for, that appointment, that house, that promotion, that standing in your community, that standing even in church, that ministry you're kind of involved in, maybe it'll give you some extra stature. Maybe it's becoming part of the right mission trip. Maybe it's even just seeking to be admired as someone who has all the right answers. Jesus is pointing us to, that's an unfulfilling exchange. That's not ultimately going to fulfill because Satan and this world can't deliver that. So the bottom line of verse 8 and our, our, our answer here is what he says, Satan's got all his priorities wrong and he always does. The priority is to worship God and serve him only. And so our, our message here is follow him to priority. Well, that sounds pretty good, and you'd think that Satan would say, wow, whew, that's a great answer, Jesus. I don't know what I've got. You know, I'm going to pack it up. I'm going to regroup. Uh, that's a good one. I did not see that coming. Um, terrific. Wow, that's surprising. Good luck in the rest of your ministry. Um, I'll see you later, but uh, whew, that's, uh, I got nothing, Right? No, Satan does what any bully does when rebuffed because he's the ultimate bully. He begins to taunt. And he taunts Jesus and he goads Jesus and he goes to an even deeper level than the desire for admiration. It's this constant chase we have in our, in our sin nature for validation. He says, you know what? If you're the son of God, then prove it. All I need to do is see some proof. So our next temptation we're going to explore is validation. Now, you probably can relate, can't you? We all have a constant need for validation. We all are pursuing how to earn it, how to deliver it, how to deserve whatever standing and position we have. Um, it's everywhere in our society. It's probably nowhere more obvious, uh, to me at least, than in the realm of sports. We have a big sports crazy family. Um, my dad was a coach. I played sports, my wife played sports, our kids play sports, we love watching sports. Um, I don't know if you consider this lucky, I consider this very lucky. My wife loves to wake up in the morning to sports center and go to bed at night to sports center, so I'm very fortunate. Um, today is the Wimbledon final, the men's final in Wimbledon, and there's a whole story there of validation. I don't wanna know who won, don't tell my wife who won, we have a DVR, we're gonna watch it when we get home. Yesterday, we were watching the women's final. Serena Williams, who is considered the greatest female tennis player, even by her contemporary peers like Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova, she's the most accomplished, she's the most dominant, she's the best, there's really no question. She won the women's singles final yesterday. And no sooner was she holding the trophy above her head than the commentating started, yeah but she tied the record at 22 for the most championships. She needs one more to really validate that standing 
as a great in, the, in, her, in her particular sport. We went a whole season where the storyline for Peyton Manning, one of the greatest NFL players of all time, the whole underlying story was, you know what? If he goes through this whole final season and doesn't win the Super Bowl, will he be validated as one of the greats of all time? Because you know, that don't mean he'll retire with only one Super Bowl. So we kind of know in the sports world how this constant press for validation goes. You, you probably can relate to it yourself. You're trying to chase your business. You're standing as a mother, a father, a friend, a citizen, an involved employee in various things, constantly pursuing validation. Well, the message of this temptation is that's a misplaced pursuit. And Jesus will show us why. And I want to encourage you not to continue to be in a place where you're trying to validate the, the, the last accolade by somehow the next performance that you're pursuing. Well, Satan knows how we're wired. And so Satan decides he's going to increase his game. And how, one way we know that is he's now going to quote scripture. The audacity, he's going to quote Psalm 91 to Jesus in taunting him. He's going to say, hey, you know what? Um, we take you to a high point here. We get on the, the peak at Jerusalem's temple. Why don't you throw yourself down and prove you're the son of God? Because it is written in Psalm 91 that the, he will call his angels to save you. They will grab you before you fall. Your foot won't even hit a stone. Now, when I read that temptation, I don't know about you, but I think, what is so harmless about why he didn't do that? He did so many other things to demonstrate that he was God. Why didn't he do it? He could have done it, right? He could have done that. But he didn't do it. Why didn't he do it? It was because he subjected himself to his father's will and not his own will. He humbled himself. He answered very simply, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so his message to us is, the real validation is ultimately in humility. And he will demonstrate that ultimately by his sacrifice and his overcoming of death. But he, would, he subjected himself to his father's will and that's the message for us. The message is when we're tempted to validate, the message is to follow him to humility. Now he knows humiliation like no one else ever past present or future will know humiliation. Um, in 1650, the writer John Wall, any, any big fans of 1600s literature here? Uh, no, no book clubs uh, reviewing the Puritan writer John Wall? Really? Boy, we're a very unsophisticated group here. Uh, I am, I'm not either, but I did some preparation for the sermon in which I read some things uh, referring to this passage. John Wall wrote a very important book called None But Christ in 1650. And in it, he had a very powerful quote in which he said, all his life was a crucifixion from his cradle to his grave, from his birth to his burial. So he really understood the creator of the universe taking on human flesh, coming into the likeness and the body of a man, subjecting himself to the ultimate humiliation, even to the humility of the cross. And can you remember shades of this very same temptation? When Jesus was hanging on the tree, the leaders that put him there, what did they say? Hey, if you're the son of God, I mean, you said you'd tear the temple down in three days and build it back up. Why don't you just come down here off the cross and save yourself? Certainly you can hear threads of Satan right there. Maybe that was the next opportune time. Well, the pointing of him to humility and his example is really affirmed in Philippians chapter two, verse six. I wanna read a few verses here. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, he knows the ultimate humiliation and is giving us a model for humiliation, for humility. Um, think about it. This is the creator of the universe 
and he's allowing himself to be tempted by the very devil that he cast out of heaven and sentenced to damnation. He's taunted by a fallen angel with all of these temptations that would be something his soul, his pure holy soul would totally reject. I think more practically, you think about it, this is Jesus who God, the Father, ultimately delights in in every way, has the complete applause of heaven, the angels worship him, devils and de- the devil and demons fear him, and yet he allows himself to be taunted by the devil and goaded into jumping off a high point. Um, we're very thankful that he did not do that at the time and that he humbled himself to his father's will and he paid the price and he continued with God's plan as opposed to his own or or taking that temptation. And the writer in Philippians reminds us of what the ultimate purpose of that humility is. Verse nine says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now Derek's gonna come and continue our challenge. Thanks, Doug, well done. Amen. Good job. So we follow him to reliance. We follow him to priority. We follow him to humility. And in that, there is a pattern of temptation. There's kind of a trifecta of temptation. Satan will first tempt you to the thing. He'll tempt you to the object, right? If you can just have that, if you can just do that, if, if that person will satiate, if that job can kind of fulfill the desire that you have. The second thing that he'll do is, but think about what others will think of you. You know, a lot of people do a lot of actions based purely on what other people will say and think about them. Oh, but if I do this, then my family's going to be upset or my friends are going to be upset. So that's actually a form of temptation. It actually can be some manipulation for you to do good things, but maybe not the things that God actually wants you to do. That whole thing of validation, right, is so critical as then it turns into, but I deserve this thing. Like, I deserve it. Like, remember, I am Jesus. So I... I I can turn that stone to bread. I can come down off of the uh, roof and angels can catch me and I can descend. But Jesus' identity is not rooted in how others see what he does or doesn't deserve. His identity is rooted in who God has created him to be. And so this is, and, and who, and, and being God, right? So it's so critical that as we look at that trifecta of calling in our lives, that we know how to respond to it. But there's one more thing here, and that is we have to kind of pan out just a little bit. Why in the world does Jesus get led into the wilderness, and why would God allow temptations in our lives? Have you ever wondered that? And in this case, the text says that the Spirit, you know, led him into the wilderness and, and, and to be tempted by the devil. Now, God himself doesn't tempt that's Satan's realm, but God allows us to be tempted. And this, some, in some ways, strikes us as backwards. Like, Derek, once I get saved, aren't all the temptations supposed to stop? Because the answer is Jesus. So to everything that comes my way, I just say Jesus, and it magically disappears. See, no temptations. No one can say, well, there's you know, very little difference between your life and my life. Instead, they'd all say, the difference between my life and your life is you're never tempted for ever, anything. And here I am tempted all the time. Or is it possible that the reason that God leads us into places where temptations are allowed is actually to give us opportunity to respond differently to those same temptations than others might? See, I think there's a real key here in that in many ways, we are to follow him into growth. That temptations and the way we respond to them can be a key, it can be an opportunity to actually grow in Christ. See, the Bible never promised that God wouldn't lead you into the wilderness. What he promised was that the wilderness would actually be of benefit to you if you respond appropriately in it. The same thing is actually true with the way that we're tempted. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're in the military and you're going into war, do you really want to be next to a soldier who goes, hey, this is my first day. Nope. 
I've got no experience, no basic, nothing. I just fresh off the bus. How you doing? Is that the person you want next to you in a foxhole? No. Why? Because they've never been stressed. They've never been put in a position where they've had to respond appropriately under stress. The same thing would be true in a SWAT team. The same thing would be true in a sports team. Do you really want someone just trotting out, speaking of sports? Hey guys, my first time playing football ever. Oh, I, with hike? That's how I thought, right? No. You scrimmage, you practice, right? You learn. There is something about how we respond in the smaller temptations that actually God uses us uses to solidify our commitment to him in life. The Greek word for Jesus being tested here is a reference to an Old Testament word. And every time that that word is used in the Old Testament, it refers to God testing the reliability, the commitment, the faithfulness in those who would say that they follow him. Now, there is a big difference in what we say and what we do. Uh, one of the things that I've discovered through the years is people overestimate all they can do without Jesus and they, uh, they underestimate all they can do with Jesus. In other words, God doesn't care about that part of my life. I got this thing covered. I'll do this the way I want to do it. I know how this is going to roll out. I don't really need to bring God into the picture. And they overestimate their capacity to make things happen on their own. There's a lot of people who do that and they underestimate, right, what they can do in the power of of Christ. A part of the temptations is to kind of figure out the line between you look steady in your life and how solid are you in your actual commitment to God. It is a testing. It is a prodding. It is a seeing. It is a revealing of your priorities. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it's because we're in a three-year vision process. Last year was being steady. This year is all about solidifying. That's very much a biblical principle. So it's the idea that in the small things, even though the wolf is always at the door, when you respond appropriately, it deepens your commitment to the bigger things. For every temptation that comes across Melissa's way or my way, right, to cheat or to be distracted or simply to drift in marriage, I think that happens the most often. We just found ourselves in the doldrums, right? Or just to drift in life. For every temptation that comes our way to take the easy choice, every time we take the road less traveled, every time we solidify to make the right choice in Christ, we actually deepen our love and our commitment to each other. And this is why coming out of the temptation, Jesus, still full of the Holy Spirit, he was full of the Holy Spirit when he started the temptation, full of the Holy Spirit when he leaves the temptation. But notice that his reputation gets out and he's glorified everywhere around him. There is something about the solidifying of this is how things really are, not things the way I would hope them to be. And we play games with ourselves, right? There's a lot of things that we hope to be that aren't actually the way they should be. And I think deep in the recesses of our hearts, we know that. We started with fasting. Let me give you a couple of thoughts on fasting. People can fast from a variety of different things. Some of you can fast from food, and Jesus certainly did that in this case. But some people just need to fast from other things. You fast from the things that vie for your control, for your attention, or for your intimacy. Some people need to fast from Facebook. Some people need to fast from their phones because it's the very first thing that's on in the morning and the very last thing that goes off at night. It doesn't mean it's a forever commitment. It's just a period of time. And early in our marriage, uh, I found that the pull to TV was a very strong pull in my life. And so I would fast from TV to, uh, not to Melissa's delight, I would actually remove the TV from the living room for like a month. And she's like, hey, what did I do? Like, I'm not a part, that's not my temptation, you know. <laughs> no, no, we're one in flesh. You have to do this with me, right? Some of you just need to remove that. What is it that controls you? For some of you, it's vaping. For some of you, it's smoking. For some of you, it's anger. For some of you, it's pornography. What is the temptation? There is a pattern to it. You can try to self-validate. 
Getting the promotion might be the thing you're hinging your entire career on and only to get it and realize that it was just as empty as the position you already have. So how do you rely? What's driving your priority and how are you being humbled? And here's the question, with each passing moment, with each small thing, how are you growing as a result? It doesn't take much to get off course. And who do you rely on in the process?